Today on Superheroes of Science, we are so excited to welcome Dr. Ravi Kaparapu. Um, Dr. Kaparapu is a planetary scientist at NASA Goddard. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is quite exciting to be here. Well, so we're both very excited to have you here. And uh, we'd come across an article and uh, it had you listed on it. And uh, it definitely caught our attention. Uh, <laughs> with what you were researching there. And so it, you want to go ahead and uh, so I don't do all the spoilers and uh, you, I'll let you go ahead and kind of explain uh, what you're researching and how you got to that. Yeah. Um, so if you are uh, referring to the habitable zones one or the uh, or the alien smog one. So yeah, the maybe alien smog is what we found. Alien smog. Okay. So so maybe we'll start with the habitable zone one because that kind of leads to where the alien smog kind of you know topic uh, runs into. So um, we have, in fact, uh, maybe I can I can just uh, pull up my presentation and and just show you uh, what what why we are doing what we are doing and why people should care and why is it so interesting in the first place. So <laughs> um, there you go. If you can see my screen. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we know one habitable planet uh, right now. Oops. And, uh, oops, sorry. That I was trying, just testing out. Anyway, so we know so far Earth is the only habitable planet uh, as of now in our solar system. And we are the most advanced species on this planet that we know of, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so the question then came out uh, since centuries, uh, how are there any other habitable planets um, out there, uh, outside um, our solar system? And uh, why should we care about that? Well, uh, I give this example to people that, you know, if you move into a new neighborhood, uh, you would want to get introduced uh, to your neighbors, right? Yeah. And if you see a lot of houses, you probably go and knock on their door and say, hey, you know, I'm a new neighbor, so you know, can we be friends or whatever? So this is what we are trying to do as a, a, in, in um, exoplanet science. Uh, so I use the term exoplanet here now, which exo means outside planet, outside planets, right? So we want to see if there are planets outside our solar system. And if there are, the even more interesting thing for some of us is uh, if they have any kind of life on them, right? So Hollywood has made it easier for us to latch onto this idea already. Um, so what um, the, at the moment, uh, I can give you some statistics. It's, it's a simple thing. Oops, let's go to the next slide. Can you hear me still? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, there you go. So there, there is this term that we use now. It's called an extrasolar planet. And extra is outside, solar is sun. So there are outside sun planets, essentially. Planets orbiting other stars, not just our sun. As you know, sun is a star. Uh, right now, if you go out and look up in the sky, that's a star there. <laughs> so as of now, we know more than 4,000 uh, planets orbiting other stars. They are more than... Um, the number of planets we have within our solar system. So for centuries and millennia, we know we knew only about like seven to nine planets, but now we know more than 5,000 and thousands more are waiting to be confirmed because we just have so much of data collected from the NASA telescopes and the other European telescopes. Um, and so there are no uh, dearth of planets. There are so many of them. It's just a question of, uh, you know, what kind of planets are they? Mm -hmm. uh, and then from all this data, we found out that, you know, almost every star in our galaxy has a planet around it. If you take a random star, point it out in the sky, uh, there's a good chance that it might have a planet of any size. It could be a Saturn-sized planet or a jupiter size or an Earth-sized planet or whatever. Just to give you an idea, our Milky Way galaxy, that's the galaxy we are living in. There are so many stars in there. This is an image of that galaxy I'm showing on my slide here. Um, there are at the minimum 100 billion stars of all types uh, in our galaxy. So- Just in the Milky all, Way? Oh, I'm sorry, what was that? Just in the Milky Way, there's that many? 
that, that's yes, just in the Milky Way, those are at least 100 billion, at least. Some estimates uh, go up to 400 billion. Oh, wow. So, so, so what's from, the difference, uh, real fast, what's the difference between a solar system and a galaxy? Okay, so solar system is just one star with planets going around it. That's our, our solar system. Solar is sun. And that's why it's called a solar system. System is not the planets going around it. Whereas our galaxy is a, a combination of stars, billions and billions of stars and gas and dust. Our sun is a single star in our galaxy. And there are several billions of sun-like stars. There are several billions of um, uh, stars that are bigger than the suns and also seven bi several billions of stars that are smaller than the sun. So our galaxy is a co collection of all these stars and gas and dust. Is and that there, clear? There's multiple galaxies in the universe though, right? Oh, there are billions and billions of galaxies in the universe. Okay. So, so the numbers are, I mean, like Carl Sagan says, billions and billions. Um, the numbers are truly huge that we cannot comprehend. Our mind cannot, you know, get the scale of that number. Just to, I mean, you, for example, like I said, our own Milky Way has about 100 billion stars and our sun is a one lonely single star in there. But we are not actually lonely. We have 100 billion, you know, companions. <laughs> right. But then when you come, our nearest galaxy, a full bigger galaxy is the Andromeda galaxy. We have some two satellite galaxies called Large Magellanic Cloud and Small Magellanic Clouds. Um, they are smaller, tiny satellite galaxies that orbit around our own galaxy. But the nearest one that is as big as or even larger than ours uh, is the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, that's about, you know, several million, uh, two million light years away. That we'll, we'll come to that a bit later. And so it is, uh, if, if the statistics we found that every, almost every star in our galaxy has a planet around it is true. And if our galaxy has 100 billion stars at the minimum, that means that we may have at least 100 billion planets in our galaxy um, that we know of. That's an unimaginable number at the minimum. Uh, so, so as you know, our sun has about seven to nine planets, nine planets at them. If you count Pluto, uh, if you don't count Pluto, it's eight planets, right? Um, so let's go with the eight number. Uh, if our sun has eight planets and, you know, uh, almost every star has at the minimum one or two planets, the number explodes to, to 200 billion or 300 billion planets in our galaxy. It's just too many of them. And so why did it take so long for us to find them if there are so many? It's because of, you know, we haven't, we have, they are so far away, the stars are so far away. Even the nearest star, for example, Proxima Centauri, it's called the nearest star, the name of that. Um, the nearest star is around four light years uh, away from us. A light year is the distance the light travels in one year. It's a distance measurement, not a time measurement, right? And so if you try, like, so to put it another way, if you take a spaceship and travel with the speed of light, you will take four, four to 4.5 uh, years uh, to go to the nearest star to us. That's the Proxima Centauri. Well, you will say, okay, and we don't have a light, cap light speed capable spaceship. We have only, you know, uh, the spaceship that we use. Okay, great. If you want to take the, the fastest human made uh, spacecraft, uh, I think it's either the Parker Solar Probe or the New Horizon spacecraft that went to Pluto. Any one of them, let's say. Let's take those spaceships. And if we travel with their speed, those are the most fastest ones we have launched. It would take, to go to the next star, it would take 75,000 years. Oh, wow. right. right. Yeah. So that gives us a time scale measurement, an idea about how far things are in our, in, even in our nearest solar neighborhood. And uh, by the way, you, um, our star, the sun, is not just staying at one location in the Milky Way galaxy. It's going around the center of our Milky Way, just like planets are going around the sun. The sun is going around the galaxy uh, around its center. 
How long does it take? Well, it takes 250 million years our sun to go around it. So to, to uh, just think about it, that means when dinosaurs were alive 100 million years ago, and I, I know they, they, they passed away <laughs> 66 million years ago, um, if dinosaurs, uh, if you take 100 million years ago when the dinosaurs were there at their prime, our sun was a different part of the galaxy than it is right now. So we have visited uh, several, our Earth at least, has visited um, uh, different neighborhoods uh, in our galaxy over the time. And yeah. so this, yeah. What's special about the center of the galaxy that everything in the galaxy revolves around it? Is it a, a density thing? Uh, why do we revolve around the center of the galaxy? It's because of the, the gravitational force of a massive object at the center. Just like, you know, our solar system has a massive object at the center, which is our sun. Similarly, we have a massive, super massive object at the center of our galaxy. And I'll, I'll give you two guesses, but you'll need only one. Well, I was going to get a black hole. Black hole, that's what I said. Correct. There you go. Uh, the super massive, gal super massive black hole is at the center of our galaxy. And uh, we know that it's super massive because... Uh, uh, we have observed stars going around it, an, an unknown dark object, and they trace the paths of the stars uh, circling around it. And over time, they found that, you know, they estimated the mass of that uh, unknown dark object. And it turned out to be, you know, 10 million times the mass of the sun or something. There is no object, no star that is 10 million times uh, more massive than the sun and still be able to exist. So it has to be a black hole. Okay. Uh, and then, by the way, I think in the last year or so, um, uh, no, the Nobel Prize was awarded to this discovery that to, for the discovery of a supermassive black hole uh, at the center of our galaxy. Oh, cool. And that's just at the center of our galaxy. That just kind of hit me. That's that's not counting all the other galaxies. Correct. Oh, wow. Correct. The scale is unimaginable you know, uh, reality is stranger than the fiction. So this is- this I like is what that. It, what's that? I like that. Reality is stranger than the fiction. That's, That's correct. <laughs> and, and, and there are so many of them. And in fact, Andromeda galaxy, the one nearer to us is much bigger than us. So the center of that Andromeda galaxy is the supermassive black hole is even more massive and larger than our own galaxy's uh, supermassive black hole. And these two galaxies are approaching each other. And so in several million years, they're going to collide with each other. Oh, the galaxies will? Yeah. Oh, well, that should be interesting. <laughs> right, right. I hope to live to that point. Or maybe I have a dentist appointment at the time, but I'll, I'll be <laughs> <coming>. <laughs> Just a few million years away. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's hard to get an appointment. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, what I know this deviates just a little bit from what we're going to talk about. But do we? What I, I remember hearing, and it's I mean, you get knowledge, but it had, it wasn't vetted by any means. That a, a black hole was like a star that went supernova and then collapsed on itself. Is that still the leading theory or is that never a theory? That is one way to make a black hole that those are called the stellar mass black hole. So stellar star mass means mass black holes, which means they, those kind of star, those kind of black holes are made from stars. Okay. So that's one way of making a black hole. There are different ways of making a black hole. So for example, the center of our Milky Way galaxy is 10 million times, um, more massive than the sun. There is, if there is no star that can sustain that long with that much mass, how did the black hole form in the first place? Oh. Right, so, so that is definitely not a stellar mass black hole. It's, it was not formed by you know, what you said about you know, collapsing a star and making a black hole. It formed during the formation of our galaxy itself because of this intense mass, you know, uh, coming uh, closer and closer to the center as the gas disk is, you know, uh, going around the center and the mass accumulated at the center and it was so massive that it 
it, it, there was a seed black hole and then it started eating up a lot. And so that's how the black hole formed. It formed from the mass itself, mass of the matter that's collapsing, not from the star, not from a star, any star. Okay. Okay. So to have it all things, I'm sorry, I got us off track a little bit. But yeah, this is, yeah, this is great. I'm telling you, the, 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 <laughs> the universe is so much, there's so much to talk about. Um, so yeah, so we, we know billions and billions of stars are uh, and uh, in our galaxy, and we know now that billions and billions of planets are there in our galaxy now. So that, then the question is, you might ask, what kind of planets are out there? Are they Earth-like or Jupiter-like or so, or any other class of planets? Well, we did find um, Jupiter-sized planets. We did find Earth-sized planets. But we also found some a new class of planets called super Earths or mini Neptunes. Super Earths are not where Superman comes from. So it comes from Krypton. But <laughs> these are these are the planets that are slightly bigger than the Earth, but smaller than the Neptune in our in our in our in our solar system. Yeah. Imagine. I mean, think about this. Maybe I have a slide here. Oh yeah, I do have a slide. Uh, but I'm. For, the pe for people who can't look at this, think about um, the solar system. What are the first four planets in our solar system? Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Those are all smaller, what we call as terrestrial planets, right? Mm -hmm. And then comes Jupiter and Saturn. Those are what we call gas giant planets, the biggest ones in our, in our system. Mm -hmm. And then after that comes Uranus and Neptune. Those are slightly scaled down versions of Jupiter and Saturn, but way larger than Earth and Mars or Venus and Mercury, right? Mm -hmm. But there is no planet that is so, so for uh, between the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, Earth is the largest planet. And the next largest planet of the Earth is directly Neptune or Uranus, one of them. But there is no planet in size in between them. Apparently, what we are finding now is that there are so many planets in our galaxy um, that are the size in between Earth and Neptune size uh, that they are the most dominant ones. Oh. Then the question comes, well, if they are the most dominant planets, if these intermediate size planets between Earth and Neptune are the most dominant ones, why don't we have them in our system? Yes in our solar system. Why do we have only Earth and then bam, we have Uranus or Neptune, nothing in between. That's a good question. The answer is not clear. Could be, there are there could be a planet in between the size way outside in the backyards of the, so our solar system. Or maybe because Jupiter and Saturn are gas giant planets, maybe during our solar system formation, those planets got kicked out. Why those planets only got kicked out? Why, why haven't we kicked out Earth, for example, or Neptune? We don't know. So we just don't know why we don't have one. <clears throat> right. So that's an interesting statistic that we have that the universe, at least our galaxy, is dominated by these intermediate mass planets. And there comes then uh, the question is, if those are the kinds of planets we have and smaller planets are more common is what we found. Then the question is, if smaller planets are most common, are there any good candidates? And you might ask, what is meant by a good candidate here? Well, we know where life could arise and potentially live. And for, for life to do that on any planet, it needs to have some sort of basic conditions. For example, uh, it needs to be at the right distance from the star. It can be too close. It can be too far away. Right, and that's where the concept of the habitable zone comes in. That's the that's what the Goldilocks zone uh, that we were thinking about. Mm -hmm. The first criteria we look when we are looking at planets outside our solar system is when is is the planet the right distance from the star. Okay. And this is where the concept of the habitable zone comes. So it's the, it is the basic definition we talk about, at least in the exoplanet field is the region around a star where a terrestrial size planet 
with a suitable atmosphere can maintain liquid water on its surface. Notice how politically uh, very carefully crafted definition this is. I'm saying terrestrial sized planet with a suitable atmosphere with maintaining liquid water on its surface. So there are several caveats I've added here if you haven't noticed that. Yeah. And there is a reason for that. Uh, why am I insisting on terrestrial mass planet, which is Earth size or, uh, you know, rocky kind of planets? Well, because we have one example of where life ar um, arises on this in, in our solar system, and that happened to be on a small size planet, which is Earth. And so it's natural for us to go and look for Earth size planets uh, uh, to find life on other uh, exoplanets. I also mentioned suitable atmosphere. Now, what do you, what does that mean? Suitable atmosphere could be a nitrogen, oxygen dominated atmosphere, like we have some water vapor in its, uh, in its atmosphere too. Well, you, then you might question, well, you are talking too closely about Earth. So are you trying to find an Earth-like planet? Well, yeah, because that's what we want to look for. Why do you want to look for Earth? Why can't you look for, maybe there, is other, there are other planets where life could arise even if they don't have Earth-like condition. Absolutely correct, not a problem but we don't know how to look for it. What does that mean? Well, think about it. Let's say your friend invites you to a new party and you go there, you don't know anyone over there and you go to the party. What, are, what is the first thing you do there? The first thing you do is to see if you know anyone in the party and see and start a conversation, right? So the first thing you do is to go and identify something that you know. And from there you can have built connections. This is what we are doing in exoplanet uh, science too. We are, you know, we found the party. We just want to, you know, we are invited to the party. So we just want to go and so find someone we know, similar to the Earth, Earth-like atmosphere, Earth-like conditions. Right. And we also want to look for liquid water on the surface. Why liquid water on the surface? Why don't you look for liquid water below the surface? Why not? Can you find there must be life below the surface? Like, I mean, we found life under Antarctic ice. And when we went there and looked, right? That's great. Fantastic. We had the luxury of going to that place and dig, or even going to Mars or Europa or to one of the Jupiter moons to dig and look for life under the surface. We don't have that kind of luxury or what capability uh, spaceships to go to exoplanets and look for life. We have only remote telescopes. So we have to do remote observations. We have to take our telescopes, look at the planet, look at set at atmosphere and see what kind of gases are there. That's all we can do right now. We have to take what the universe gives us. And the reason for liquid water on the surface is because if you have liquid water on the surface, that means there could be potential life that can interact with the atmosphere above it and change the gas composition in the atmosphere. And that can give us uh, some clues if we are observing through our telescope uh, at that atmosphere, what kind of gases are there and potentially conclude that planet may have life on it. So that's so how, why we, yeah. How would you know that there was, using only telescopes, that there is liquid water on a planet? Uh, so we look for water vapor signatures. So uh, do I have, um, so I'm going to come back to that. Uh, in a minute, but essentially what we do is when a planet is orbiting a star, the starlight passes through the atmosphere of the planet. And then we, we uh, look at the light that passes through the atmosphere of the planet and comes towards us. Why? Because when the light starlight passes through the atmosphere, the gases in the atmosphere absorb, uh, they put their fingerprints on the light where they are at, at specific um, uh, places. Yeah. And so once we use our telescope and look at that light passing through the atmosphere, we can find those fingerprints of the gases. And we know where those fingerprints are. For example, we know where water absorbs uh, in that light. And then we can look for that particular um, water vapor feature and say, okay, if we see an absorption at this particular light um, uh, wavelength or you know, at location of the light from the planet, and if, we, if it matches with the water vapor signal, we know it is water vapor. Okay. That makes sense. I like okay. how you quantify the, our like Goldilocks zone is 
confined by our technology at this point. It, right. There's yeah. only so much that we can actually discover. And it's it, there might be a day as technology increases, that we actually expand this zone and where we under, have a better understanding of it, it could, habitation could occur and we could then measure that. But right now we, we're confined with the technology we have. And I, I, I like that you point that out. Right. But remember that everything we do, even with our eyes, even with our instruments, is, is a detector, which means we use it. We, use, we are using some eye, uh, detectors here uh, to observe uh, uh, nature around us and the universe around us. So we are always limited by what instrument we are using. Uh, the instrument, where, for example, we do everyday life is our eyes. And so if we, there, are, there are things that we, our eyes can't see, like infrared radiation or ultraviolet radiation. But there are some animals and you know, insects can see. And so it, it's all limited by how we are uh, doing the observation. And in this case, we are limited by, like you said, uh, the, the telescope observations remotely. Yeah, so you've defined habitable, and we understand the Goldilocks zone now, which I've heard of before. So I've, I was glad you explained that. So how in the world do you get to alien smog? That's an excellent question. So in the search for this uh, habitable uh, planets within the habitable zone, uh, we are thinking about life, right? It could be any life. It could be microbial life that could exist on the planet. It could be some kind of a complex life like animals, trees, or whatever it is, though that's a complex life. But then if we can think about those, why don't we think about technological life as well? What makes us um, you know, uh, think uh, about a biological life and not think about technological life? So there is no reason to do that. We are a technological species on this planet. Uh, evolution has created this um, biological life and eventually technological life as well. So if we can look for biological life, let's look for technological life as well. Then the question is, okay, great. When, when uh, I know how to find a biological life because you know, uh, biology uses oxygen and carbon dioxide. That's what we use. That's what plants use. I don't know most of the organisms use. So if we find, you know, nitrogen, oxygen, ozone, carbon dioxide, water vapor, methane is one good signal by the way, because a lot of, uh, um, our uh, biology uh, emits uh, methane. Mm -hmm. So that's great. If you find all these gases, we can find the uh, biology, we can potentially conclude that it could be a biological life. But what are the signs of a technology? Where do you, how do we go find a technology, uh, technological life on, on distant planets? So this is where the idea came that we were thinking that, uh, what happens uh, if we find a technological life somewhere else? How do we find and go look for them? And this is where the field of techno signatures uh, has uh, started in the last couple of years. Uh, I would like to say that, you know, there's also biosignatures. Biosignatures are the signs of biology on a planet. Techno signatures are signs of technology on a planet. Now, uh, we know, um, uh, in the last couple of years, um, even in the last uh, decades, five, six decades, you all heard about the SETI search, the radio SETI search, right? Uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah. Um, we have been uh, doing that kind of a radio search for techno technological uh, civilizations. That's one way to find the technological civilizations. Look for radio communication between us and them or whatever. But now, because of these telescopes that can find biosignatures, the science of biology, you know, the fingerprints of water and ozone and oxygen and so on, can we use our telescopes to find gases in the atmosphere of a planet that can indicate the science of technology? You might ask then, well, what are the gases a technological civilization can emit that we can look for? So this is where uh, our... Uh, uh, research idea came about, uh, which is that, oops, uh, during the, I'm going to go to a slide where I, I have it. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw a news article somewhere, it's about a year ago, 
that um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, due to the lockdown, then global concentrations of nitrogen dioxide, it's a gas, uh, were observed to decrease over the globe, over the urban areas uh, around the globe. And we were like, okay, what is nitrogen dioxide? Where, how is it coming from? Where is it coming from? Uh, so we started digging a little bit, and uh, I, this is just an animation I'm showing for, for people who can't see, and I uh, apologize, but it's just an animation of uh, United States uh, uh, map where they show between January 2020 to March 2020 how much nitrogen dioxide amounts decreased uh, on, on, um, in the cities uh, across the United States. So, so, so you may ask, why is nitrogen dioxide special? Why, why did you know, some scientists observe this and reported this news? Well, the thing is nitrogen dioxide are among the main pollutants in the industrialized locations on the globe. So it's one of the most uh, uh, pollutant that you get when you burn fossil fuels like, uh, like we do. Um, there are other ways to produce nitrogen dioxide, not just pollution. For example, if wildfires, uh, biology, even lightning uh, can produce uh, nitrogen dioxide. But here is the important thing. The human generated nitrogen dioxide is far, far higher than the biologically produced nitrogen dioxide. So we are producing more nitrogen dioxide in the form of pollution and emitting into the atmosphere compared to what the biology, the natural world is producing. So that gave us an idea that you know what, that if we are looking for life like us uh, on other planets, biology like, uh, uh, like we have right now on our planet, then why don't we look for technology like we have right now on, on our, our planet? And one way to look for that kind of technology is this nitrogen dioxide pollution that we have. And that is an alien smog uh, that we, uh, you know, that, that you probably heard um, in, in, the, in the news article. Mm -hmm. And that makes and, sense. And you could also get, you could also detect that because that would have, like you said, a fingerprint when you're right. looking at the spectroscopy of that. Correct, correct. And that is the paper we have published. I'm, I'm not going to go through that paper now because it's going to be, you know, it's a very technical paper. Um, <laughs> but the idea here is that uh, the, the question we asked is that can we, if you take Earth and keep it at, let's say, 30 light years away from us, okay, why 30 light years? Well, it's 10, it's, it's, it's a number. So we, we moved it progressively farther and farther distances from us. So if you take Earth sun and keep the Earth sun at let's 30 light years away, can you detect the nitrogen dioxide pollution if you have a planet at that distance with our telescopes? Or do we need extra super high five telescopes to even detect it? Mm -hmm. And what we found is that, well, you can find it with our current telescope technology. So if you have a planet, if you have a planet around a sun-like star, 30 light years from us in any direction, and it is on an Earth, if it has an Earth-like planet, and if it has a nitrogen dioxide pollution, by whatever means, either, either a civilization on that planet generated or some other way, then we will be able to detect it within um, you know, some time. So are we looking for fluctuations in the amount of nitric oxide in the air atmosphere, or are we looking for just having a, a high enough saturation within their atmosphere, and then we're going to classify that as highly potential to be an alien race? So we need to know. Uh, so the, there, there are there is a way to we can. The first thing is we can never be sure. Once we found any fingerprint, we can never be 100% sure uh, that it's coming from alien technology or alien um, you know, civilization. Because like I said, there is a natural way of producing it. Yeah. Maybe that planet is producing more biological nitrogen dioxide. Biology is producing more than what Earth is here is producing, right? Mm -hmm. So it could be a false positive. Maybe the biology is so active there that it can compensate 
uh, to the amount of uh, nitrogen dioxide. So it can produce more. And so we may mistake it as a technology because, oh yeah, we find a lot of nitrogen dioxide. So, hey, that could be a technology. Well, you first have to make sure it is not coming from biology, right? But if biology would imply life still, right? It still is a great idea. You nailed exactly what I was thinking. Thank you. I mean, that's absolutely what the way I was thinking. If you find this nitrogen dioxide, and if you conclude that, well, it is not coming from technology, it still is a great find because you have found an alien planet with life on it. So there you go. <laughs> I love that. So you, I mean, you're able to not only discover potential alien life, you're able to discover and potentially classify alien life by uh, levels of technology. Correct. It's, it's, it's amazing. We, it's a win-win situation for us. And so when, or do we have to, uh, sorry, Sarah, I, I, I see you started just as soon as I, the same time as I did. I'll let the next one. Um, do we need to calibrate telescopes? I mean, are we going to, do we need to recalibrate Hubble so we can start looking for the spectral signature of uh, the nitric oxide? What do we need to do? Right? How can we find ET? Wow, this is, this, is, this is the coolest part of it. We don't have to schedule or calibrate a separate observation for this kind to detect nitrogen dioxide. For example, if, you, if we find a really good candidate that we think, oh, should look at it with our telescopes, uh, uh, what, do you mean, what do I mean by really good planet? Well, if it is in the habitable zone, first of all, great, good. Let's go for point our telescope to that point. Until then, we won't know what is there. We just know if the planet is in the habitable zone. That's all. Okay, let's point our telescope to it. Then we start seeing, let's say over time, uh, we start seeing oxygen on it. Well, well that, that's interesting, that's good. Then we start seeing, you know, water vapor, nitrogen. Then, oh, that's even better, that's great. Then we start seeing methane, carbon dioxide, which is very similar to all these gases, very similar to what we have on earth. So that's a strong candidate, right? All of these gases cannot exist. Uh, at the same time in a, in, a, in a planet's atmosphere because oxygen and methane don't like each other. So they need to have been continuously produced to maintain that levels. Otherwise they'll, they'll just uh, you know, eat away each other. So if we say, you see all these gases and we say, hmm, that's a really good strong candidate. Then someone says, someone like me comes and says, hey, please, can I have some telescope time to look for nitrogen dioxide? You know, I just want to see if there is a technology there or on the planet. Uh, then they'll ask, uh, how much time do you need? Then I'll say, oh, you don't need, you know, whatever you have done until now is good for me because you can use the same telescopes with the same technology and still look for it. You just have to look at a different place in the data. That's all. Well, Sir. so what is the potential then for, like, let's say someone's listening to this and they get really inspired, like, oh my gosh, I want to, I want to look for that. I want to do that. Are we, have we pretty much exhausted? Have we, have we found everything we're going to find or are we just at the very beginning? Is there, how much potential for research is there? It is. We have started only recently. In fact, this is probably one of the first papers we have published in the study of the atmospheric techno signatures. So we are thinking about ideas. So we need new ideas about what else can we do? So this is by no means uh, the end of it. It is just the beginning. So if people have ideas and want to contribute to this study of looking for these techno signatures and want to come into the field, we, I mean, we, we, we we're looking always looking for new ideas, right? So this is good. No, I love this. Just fascinating, yeah. This is awesome. I just love that we're, we're classifying potential alien life. I mean, Im right, imagine this. We have always asked the question, whenever someone says we are looking for life on other planets, they'll say, oh, we are trying to ask the age old question, are we alone? Uh, and even for biosignatures to find biological life, we say, oh, are we, are we, any, any presentation, any talk, any discussion starts with, we want to answer the question, are we alone? Here is the thing, who is asking that question? Well, a technological life is act, uh, actually asking that question on a planet. 
And so when we are talking about are we alone question, it's a technological civilization that's asking that question to find out what is out there. And so there's nothing wrong. There is, there is, there's, that's an immense motivation to start looking for technological life. I like that. I love this. <laughs> this is awesome. It's the first time that I've heard someone, you know, talking about being able to classify what we're looking for and not yeah. just randomly looking for. Right. But uh, I mean, the fact that you're finding ways of searching for potential life and being able to determine where they might be as far well, as it, and using instruments and and research that's already that's existing that's already there that yeah. i love that that's right i mean it's not a question of when it's uh or it's a, not a question of if but it's a question of when we find life on other planets it's just a matter of time wow no okay let, let's say let's say that we find something it's right in the Goliath zone it's it's there it's sweet it's where we need it to be and you're seeing these signatures and you're like oh it, not only are we not only is there high probability of life there's high probability of, of life with technology what then oh then we'll keep looking for the observations and then our radio city friends will come into the picture they'll they'll say hey and we'll say hey guys do you, could you send some signals or at least listen yeah. you know uh -huh. anything coming from that so that's when we uh, you know we can start looking for more interesting things okay not, not necessarily sure. okay. yeah all of us at once <laughs> go ahead yes i mean can you imagine the excitement at that point i i'll be probably jumping up and down <laughs> <laughs> well I just this I'm not quite sure how to ask this question. You had, I know earlier in the conversation you had said we can detect within 30 light years of our sun, you know, um, using spectroscopy and, and the different things. And that's with um with the gas signatures. So with the the radio signals, it, can we detect farther? What's do you know the limit for detection there? Yes. Uh I was it, it's it's much farther away. Um okay. in, thousand light years or something like that okay so in in a volume so so narrowing it down then if, if we're, we're kind of narrowing it down really at that point then right if we're finding biosignatures or technology signatures and then we have like a really narrowed down place like okay let's let's beam a radio signal here <laughs> so we know. correct that's right and and that so this is what we can do right now this is what we we are thinking at uh, at our level of technology and we are extrapolating that to say, oh, maybe they will have that kind of technology. The question we always think about, in fact, this is one of the most fundamental question. Do we, can we re recognize a techno signature if we see one? Mm -hmm. So if you show, just 500 years ago, if you show a cell phone to any of the medi medieval ages, if you go there and then show them a cell phone, do they recognize what it is? Even just 500 years ago. Exactly. So maybe we have already found a techno signature. Maybe the techno signature is right, you know, facing us right now. But we just can't look at it because this, this is called inattentional blindness that we just are not looking out at that angle, at the, in that perspective, to look for such a yeah, out of the box thinking signature. We are always thinking about earth life, earth techno signature, gases, and things. But there is probably that civilization has advanced so much, they produce a techno signature that is so beyond our imagination, we don't even recognize what it is. It's there right now, I guess. Who knows? We just can't, we're not looking. That just, oh, it just blows my mind. That's, yeah. <laughs> That's the <same> way. <laughs> I like to think about that. That is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I got to ask a couple times when you popped up, did I see a Star Trek emblem on that shirt? Uh, I yes. was going to ask that too, and I thought, no, it's fair. I'm a big Star Trek fan. I'm a big tricky, so. I'll... <laughs> My dad is too. He's going to love that. I just said, sure, we're fine. <laughs> I know. So I, I've even gone to a convention, Star Trek convention. So I, <laughs> I'm. That's really I'm, cool. <laughs> yeah, I've went in as in Star Trek uniform at a convention before. Right. That's good. That's nice. It, yeah. It's not my default costume for the cosplay, but it's one that I've done. Thank you so much for your time. Gosh, we really appreciate it.
not a problem. It was very nice to meet you both.